Okay, it's all yours, Ray. Father, we uh, are so grateful for the fact that you're in control. And nothing takes you by surprise. And we know that as Christians, all things work together for good because we love you and are called according to your purpose. So we rejoice in our trials and our tribulations because we know they work for us. Pray for the unsaved as they're shaken uh, by what's going on in the world, that they'll be shaken into common sense and listen to the gospel and get right with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen, amen. Well, uh, as see, I... I've got, a, I've got a little echo. Oh, okay. Hang on Anybody one second there. That? Is that better? Uh, one, two, three. Yes, it's still the echo. Wonderful. Okay, well, as I have been uh, letting everybody know, here we are, Thursday or Friday evening this time. It's not a Thursday. And uh, for those of you that are just wandered by and don't know... Uh, what you've stumbled into. My name is Steve, and I'm the doorman for the Lord's Round Table. Uh, it's a table that never gets too crowded. And the Lord just continues to expand it, and there's always room to come in and sit down. You're all, each and every one of you is welcome, and we're just appreciative that you're here with us uh, tonight. And as many of you know, I don't like to use the word guest speaker. That seems kind of, or seems kind of secular to me. I like to use the the phrase brother, because the Lord is always showing us how much larger our family tree is, and it just continues to grow, and I praise God for that. So uh, here with us this evening is our brother Ray Comfort. Um, I know a lot of you know him, and uh, he's been with us on the Lord's Roundtable uh, before. So we just praise it, praise God uh, that he has given us this opportunity once again. And Ray, we're so grateful to have you here with us this evening. And, uh, you know, we're going to turn it over to you, brother, because we're excited about having you here and what you have to say. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to address what we're going through at the moment. Uh, right across the whole world, it's quite an amazing experience. I feel as though I'm in a, a Hollywood movie about the end time, but we don't wake up from it. The movie doesn't end. It's, it's still there the next morning. It's, it's quite surreal to go out in the streets and see everyone with masks and everybody avoiding everybody and you know, we've seen uh, that this is devastating for human health. It's an absolute tragedy with people dying. Economically, it's terrible. Politically, it's disastrous. But spiritually, it's wonderful, absolutely incredible. I've been, uh, for the last year, twice a day, going around to a local college and interviewing people and sharing the gospel with students and filming them for our YouTube channel because we put up a new YouTube uh, uh, video every day a channel's just passed 112 million views. And so we see this as a wonderful opportunity to reach right around the world with the, with the glorious gospel. And over the last couple of weeks, since this uh, virus has reared its ugly head, I've seen such an openness from students really listening, saying, I understand and I want to get right with God. And I think it's because they're having a midlife crisis early. Steve, I don't know if you've had a midlife crisis. No one actually can have a midlife crisis. I don't know if you realize that. To have a midlife crisis, we've got to figure out how long we're going to live for. And we don't know how long we're going to live for. So how do you find out the middle of your life to have a crisis? But another word for midlife crisis would be people realizing their mortality. They suddenly figure out because of this virus, they could die today. And they're not going to, they may not live till they're 93. So it puts a sense of urgency in their heart, and that's really good because every single one of us has had eternity placed on our hearts by God. The Bible says he's put eternity in our hearts. We're not like dogs or cats or horses or cows. We're not beasts that don't have understanding. The Bible says we're made in the image of God. And so there's something in us that says, oh, I don't want to die. That's our God-given will to live, and we are wise when we listen to it because there's no other means of finding everlasting life outside of Jesus Christ. All those man-made religions, those huge religions, cannot offer forgiveness of sins nor assurance of salvation. Jesus can. So the gospel is good news for atheists, for Buddhists, for Hindus, for Muslims, for churchgoers. Whosoever will may come. There's a universal call to the whole of humanity where God himself says, I've made a way for you to have everlasting life. There's a way past death and 
I don't know if you realize that the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15, that all humanity are haunted by the fear of death all their lifetime. It takes our breath away when we think about it. And you get the proud person who says, oh, when you're dead, you're dead. I'm not afraid of dying. When your number's up, it's up. They're the proud, arrogant, self-righteous person who, don't, who doesn't think very deeply. But if someone's got a humble heart, and I often ask people this, I say, are you afraid of dying? They will admit they are. They'll say, yeah, I'm terrified. I don't even like to think about it. It's so horrific. And so they're the people that are open to the gospel so often. Someone who's got a humble heart, who's afraid of dying, then they're, 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 they're prepared to listen. So I'd like to address that. If you're an unsafe person, I'd like to talk to you about your fear of death and how God can deal with it and give you something that will change everything. And if you're a Christian, I'd like to uh, equip you, if I may, with a wonderful tool that God has given us. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What I'd like to do is look at Exodus 4, if I remember rightly, I can't remember the verses, but it's a wonderful discourse between Moses and God himself. And Moses says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Sorry, God says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. And Moses said, oh, I, I don't know what to say. They want, what if they don't believe me? Well, you know, what if they think, God, you haven't sent me? He's got all these excuses. And then God asked him a, a, an interesting question, very thought-provoking and strange question. He said, what is that in your hand? Now, God is omniscient. He knows all things. And he knew what was in the hand of Moses. But he was trying to point out to Moses he had something in his hand that was special. It was a rod known as the rod of Moses. And so God said to Moses, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground, and it turned into a biting serpent. And Moses was fearful. And God says, take it by the tail. So he took it by the tail, and it didn't bite him. And he said, if they don't believe you, give them that sign so they'll believe that I sent you. He says, if they don't believe, put your hand in your breast now and pull it out, and you'll see it's leprous. And it was. He says, put it back in, and he took it out, and it was white as snow, it was clean. He says, if they don't believe the first sign, they'll believe the second. If they don't believe the second, here's the third. Take water and pour it out, and it will turn to blood. And so there are three incredible tools that God has given to you and I. God says to you and I, what's that in your hand? You and I have something that is so powerful so incredible it can make non-Christians believe the gospel. It's the rod of God's law, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, those commandments that you and I have written on our heart. We know it's wrong to lie and steal and blaspheme and commit adultery and commit murder. The work of the law is written on our heart via the conscience. Well, God says, throw that down. Throw that law down at the face of the ungodly. And when you meet an unsafe person, Throw the law at their feet. In other words, show them their sin. And you can take that biting law that calls to our death by the tail. If you're a Christian, it will not hurt you. T.L. Moody said, the law can only trace a man to Calvary no further. Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, for there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Before we came to Christ, that law called for our death. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans said, that law which I thought was ordained to life was death to me. It's a biting serpent. It's like the civil law calling for the death of a man who's committed multiple murders. It will not let him go. It wants to execute him so that justice will be done. And that law abides on us. God's wrath is fury against sin. It calls for our blood. And so the way to show someone that they're a sinner in God's eyes is to open up the law as Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount. Just ask someone, do you think you're a good person? The Bible says most every man will proclaim his own goodness. They think they're good people. So what you've got to do is do what Jesus did in Mark 10, verse 17, when a man said he was good. He said, you know the commandments. Jesus threw the commandments at the feet of this man. And so that's what you and I do. We do what Paul did in Romans chapter 2 when he said, you who say you shall not steal. Do you steal? Do you say you shall not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? Just say to someone, how many lies do you think you've told? Have you ever stolen something? They say, yeah, I've told a few lies. I have taken small things. 
And so you say, so you're a lying thief. Is that correct? I say, I guess so. Have you ever used God's name in vain? The third commandment. I say, I all the time. I say, but do you use your mother's name as a cuss word? They say, no, I, I respect my mother. And yet you don't respect God. This holy name isn't spoken by godly Jews or even written in it. So it's schema. And you've taken his holy name and brought it down to the level of a filth word to express disgust. It's called blasphemy. The Bible says the Lord will not hold him guilty if he takes his name in vain. It's death sentence for blasphemy in the Old Testament. What you're doing is throwing that serpent down and letting him be bitten by it to show him he's in terrible mortal danger. And then you say, Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked with lust? And I say, yeah, I do it all the time. And say, well, look, by your own admission, you are lying, deceiving, blasphemous, adulterate heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty. You say, man, I'll be dealt with that. That's standard. Will you go to heaven or hell? And they say, oh, we'll go to hell. I say, you're right. The Bible says all liars shall their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no blasphemer, no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. So what can you do to be made right with God? And they say something like, oh, repent. Say, well, that won't help you. And that's like saying to a judge after you've robbed a bank and shot the guard as you were leaving, I'm sorry, judge, I'll never do it again. The judge will say, of course you should be sorry, and of course you shouldn't do it again. You'll go into jail. So repentance can't save you in civil court, and it's not going to save you on judgment day. You need something else. You need the mercy of God. You know, Jesus likened salvation in John 3, verse 15 and 16, to the biting serpent. He said, as Moses uh, lifted up a serpent upon a pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. You and I broke God's law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. If you're in court and someone pays you fine, a judge can let you go. Even though you're guilty, you can say, look, there's a stack of speeding fines here. You're terribly guilty. This is so serious. But someone paid them. You're free to go. Even though you're guilty, he can let you go because someone paid the fine, and he can do that which is legal and right and just. And even though you and I are guilty of violating those, that law, heading for hell, very serious sins in the sight of God, he can take the death sentence off us because Jesus paid the fine in his life's blood. And then he rose from the dead and defeated death. And if you and I will repent and trust alone in him, God will immediately remit our sin. Repentance must be sincere. Don't call yourself a Christian and continue to fornicate and lie and steal and blaspheme. That slander hypocrite you're just deceiving yourself. Must be sincere in your repentance. When you, when you turn from sin, make sure you turn from all sin. And then trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. The minute you do that, you've got God's promise to remit your sin, take the death sentence off you, and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Now, that's the gospel, using the law to bring the knowledge of sin. If you don't believe that, then I go to the second sign that will help you believe. Remember Moses put his hand in his breast and pulled it out, and it was leprous, and he put it in again and pulled it out, and it was white? That's your testimony. Let me give mine. The moment I repented of my sin, the moment I read the words of Jesus, whoever looks upon a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery with her in his heart, the moment I read that was like an arrow hit my chest. I thought, man, I'm unclean. God has seen my uncleanness. He's seen my filthy sexual imagination. He's seen that I've got a, I've got a multitude of sins. If that comes out on judgment day, I'm heading for hell. The moment I repented of sin and put my faith in Jesus, God took my filthy, leprous, sinful heart and made me white as snow in his sight. He cleansed my heart instantly by his grace. Though my sins were scarlet, they should be as white as snow. God will give you a personal miracle if you obey the gospel. The Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign. He said, no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. Because Jonah was swallowed by that fish and was in the three days and three nights in the heart of that fish, so the Son of Man must be in the heart of the earth. In other words, the only thing that can be assigned to you is the gospel. God's not going to open the sky and call you by name. He's given you the gospel. If you will obey it, 
He will give you a personal miracle. He will take your sin-loving heart that loves pornography, loves fornication, loves blasphemy and lying and stealing. You get excitement when you steal. You lie because you want to be happier in life. You don't want problems, so you lie your way out of it. You love the darkness. You hate the light. You come to Christ, and God will do you a, give you a thirst for righteousness. For the first time in your life, you want to do that which is right. You'll hate that which is wrong and love that which is right. So radically, it's called being born again. God says, I'll take your heart and cause you to walk in my statutes. In other words, he will cause you to do the, the things he wants you to do without him even telling you to do. And it's a miracle when you begin to thirst for righteousness, when you love your sin. And that's the power of personal testimony. Paul gave his testimony three times in the book of Acts. So if someone says, no, I don't believe in the commandments, I don't believe you're telling the truth when you're saying Christ changed your life overnight and gave you a thirst for righteousness, then we have to go to the third sign. When Moses was told to take water and pour it out and make it into blood. In other words, you just got to preach judgment to this person and say, man, I'm terrified for you. If you die in your sin, it horrifies me. You're going to be damned by Almighty God. He's going to give you justice on the day of judgment. Better fall under the face of the sun than to fall into the hands of the living God. I love you. I care about you. It breathes my heart that if death should seize upon you this night, God will give you justice, and there's no way out of hell. You won't have a hope in hell, and as sure as hell, I'm telling you the truth. You know, the Bible tells us what death is. It's wages. Romans 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death. It's like a judge in a court of law looked at a criminal who raped three young girls and then slit their throats and said, you have earned the electric chair. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. We're going to pay you in the death sentence for what you've done. And sin is so serious to God that he's given you the death sentence. You've got a nice holding cell with a big, big blue roof and a bright light and good air conditioning, but this life is a holding cell. You're going to die. Grim Reaper is going to come for you, and God is going to give you justice because your crimes are that serious they demanded the death sentence. And I wouldn't be in your shoes on Judgment Day for all to see in China. What you're trying to do is make this person fearful, and fear is good sometimes. If you were in a house and it was on fire and you lay in bed and you said, I know it's on fire, but it doesn't really worry me. I would want you to become fearful because fear will be your friend. It will make you run out of that house because your fear being burned alive. So sometimes fear is your friend. It's not your enemy. And the Bible says through the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So if you're fearful today, if my words are making you fearful, thank God for that. Because that fear is your friend. It's not your enemy. Listen to it because it will drive you to the feet of a blood-stained cross where you can receive forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. You know, this virus uh, has a test. It's pretty hard to get it. But if you want to know you've got a, that virus, uh, this uh, coronavirus, um, that test will tell you. And what I've given you is a test to say of taking you through the commandments to show you have the, you have the disease of sin and it's terminal and you must turn from it. When the police pick up a criminal they think has been drinking and, and driving, they say, this guy's breaking the law. I think he's committing a crime. They'll get you to walk a straight line. And if you're crooked, they'll arrest you. And today I've given you the straight line of God's law, the Ten Commandments. And if you're honest with yourself, you're crooked. You've broken those commandments a multitude of times. You need a Savior. And today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart because you may not be here tomorrow. Death would seize upon you tonight. I think this virus has killed 50,000 people already, and yet every day 150,000 people die of other diseases. Their hearts give out, aneurysm in their sleep, whatever. And so this is terribly serious. So please listen to the gospel, repent, and trust in Jesus. And one other thought. You know, we tend to lack a, a fear of God, and, and we sin because we're idolaters. We've got a wrong, a wrong image of God. The God that we believe in is a kind of a snuggly, cuddly God, a divine butler, a uh, celestial Santa Claus. The God that we believe in is non-existent. He's a figment of our imaginations. We're shaped to conform to our sins. And we pray to that God, and he doesn't have any moral dictates. He doesn't tell us what to do. He's kind of a snuggly teddy bear God. But the God of the Bible is to be feared. You're familiar with 2 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Chronicles 7.14. 
If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then will I forgive their sins uh, from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. It's the promise of God. Now, most Christians know that Bible verse. Second Chronicles 7.14. They've never read verse 13. This is what it says. If I send a plague among them, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and this plague definitely has come by the, by the will of God. Do you think God doesn't send plagues? Well, read what he did with Egypt. He sent 10 plagues on Egypt. He killed their firstborn. He killed a man in Genesis 38 because he didn't like what he did sexually. In the New Testament, he's the same God. He hasn't changed. Read the book of Revelation. It'll make your hair stand on end because God is to be feared, and he's given you the death sentence. At the same time, he's rich in mercy, takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and the Bible says he's the lover of your soul. So today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Repent and put your faith in Jesus today. I appreciate you listening. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, you know, I, when I watch your videos a lot, and it just amazes me how, you know, you, you have that ability. And I know that ability comes from the Lord. And that's what I'm trying to draw out here a little bit. But you have that ability to talk to them people in the street and that. And, and truly, you got a heart for them. And that makes it a lot easier as well because you, you look at them and know uh, if something was to happen to them, where their destination was going to be. They were going to hear, depart from me. But... I know that we're all called to do that. We're all called to go out and share the gospel. And there's so many that feel that they can't do that. And a lot of it's out of fear. But we know that the only reason we can do it is because the Lord enables us to do it. He's not going to call us to do something that he's not going to equip us to do. He's not going to be able to, you know, help us to do that. But you, I'm telling you, you make, you make it look so darn easy. And when I watch him videos, well, you know. I, can I say something here? Sure. Can I say something here if I may? Um, you know, I've done, a, I've done it a lot. And, and you can look at someone who's an acrobat or a, a, an athlete and say, man, they're so good at it. Because they've done it a lot, that's all. But that we're living in incredibly frustrating times. I, I have every Saturday that I've been in town. I preach the gospel open air at Huntington Beach, and I can't do that anymore. They've taped it off. I give people tracks. You can't even approach people up to six feet away. You can't witness to people. It's very frustrating. However, we have the internet, and our YouTube channel has something like over 112 million views. And can I encourage, encourage those of you that are Christians, you go to Living Waters YouTube, copy the URL, copy the address at the top, and send it all over the world. Just go to comment sections on news programs anywhere, blogs, whatever, and just say, hey, you might find this interesting when it comes to death. This puts it in a different perspective. Love to hear what you think. And just paste that address in the comment section, and people will watch it. And so you don't have to approach people and do what I do because the videos will do, do it for you. You know, I've got a dog. His name's Sam. When he sees a cat, his fur stands on end. Every muscle goes tense because the cat's his enemy. But when he sees a dog, he wags his tail. He's fascinating because he recognizes his own type. I haven't shown him an uh, uh, encyclopedia showing him what dogs look like. He knows a chihuahua is a dog, and he knows a great Dane's a dog, and he's never even been educated. It's intuitive. And we're the same when it comes to human beings. We're fascinated by them. If you've ever seen a pan of the uh, Super Bowl, you see a crowd and they zoom up on people and say, hey, that looks like Uncle Arthur. Well, look at your hair. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So we're fascinated by our own time. And particularly fascinated when we see people talk about their fear of death, when, we, when they talk about what they believe about the afterlife, things they've never thought about or talked about before. And you can listen to them and people can hear the gospel and it's not some sweaty preacher with a loose tie pointing a finger at them. They're like a fly on the wall they don't feel a sense of intimidation, and they hear the gospel through these videos. So please take advantage of these times because through these uh, these videos, we're reaching literally millions of people around the world, and it works because of people like your listeners grabbing the URL and pasting it all over the Internet, Living Waters YouTube. Amen, amen, amen. I know I'm fascinated by it. You know, I'm fascinated watching you, and... You know, even, uh, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, you sent me a banner 
um, can you pass the good uh, the good person's test? When we went oh, to that, yes. yeah, when we went to that Drugger's Jamboree, and we had a great time with them. What a door opener. You know, we put a cooler of water up on the table because we had a heat index over 100 degrees. And uh, people would come up and get a bottle of water, and they'd sit and chit-chat a minute, and I'd point at the sign and ask them, what do you think? You think you do all right on that? And, and it's just amazing, you know, um, some of the reaction you get. I had a couple people get mad and say, I don't care what you say. I'm still a good person as they stomped off. But, you know, it was really a, an eye-opener when you explain to people and you show them, you know, that there's none of us that are righteous. But it was awesome. We had a good time with that, and I do appreciate that. Well, that's great, brother. Um, am I done? You're done when you want to be done. <laughs> we, the, <laughs> you, will never, you will never hear on the Lord's round table. hey, it's been 25 minutes, start wrapping it up. You're done when you're done, brother. Well, I'd like to be done if I may because I want to spend time with my beautiful wife and uh, she just got home and I haven't spent time with her today. And, and so I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity and I want to wish you all the best and, and pray your richest blessing on your listeners and may God cause us to prosper and explode right across the world. Well, amen. But we want to pray for you before you leave. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for being the awesome God that you are, a God that watches over us takes care of us you're jehovah jireh jehovah rapha and outside of that what else do we need we have jesus christ as our lord and savior and and father god you just you just wrap us in your arms and take care of us and i just praise you for that i thank you for my brother ray i thank you for the hunger that he has for the lost souls and i pray lord that as uh, he spoke here tonight that the words that he spoke will penetrate the heart of all those that are listening that lord god today is the day of salvation because tomorrow's not promised to us that's what your word says so lord i pray that even as uh, this virus has closed down the beaches and people are trying to stay their distance away from us i pray father god for my brother you continue to open doors up unto him lord and Father God, for each and every one out here as well, and I pray, Father, that they have the courage to step out because somebody gave them the good news, somebody shared with them, and we need to share with those that haven't heard it. So, Father God, I pray you continue to bless my brother, bless everything he puts his hands to. Pray, I pray for his family, Lord God, that your heads of protection be around him as well. I pray for all the truckers running up and down the highways this weekend, that, Lord God, that you'll continue to watch over them. And, Father God, that if we're going to change somebody's life, we're going to do it by sharing the gospel and not running them over. So, Father God, I thank you for each and every one that was here this evening, Lord. I thank you for the words that were spoken. I thank you, Father, for the, the hearts that were prepared for it. And, Father God, we just give you all praise, glory, and honor. And we pray this by no other name but the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. Brother, we love you. Amen. And, uh Glad to have you, and uh, look forward to another time. Okay. God bless you guys. Bye-bye. God bless. Good night, everybody. Good night.